Good afternoon and welcome to the Listening Shelf audiobook webinar. I'm Sarah Jane Rose and this, this is Ian Pringle. <laughs> <laughs> we are Listening Self Audio and Ian and I have been narrators and performers for many years and we worked together over the last few years on a variety of projects including audiobooks, podcasts and audio drama and we have created Listening Shelf to bring those to you and to help you through the journey that is audiobooks and specifically to shine a light on UK produced work and to make connections between UK writers and UK narrators. Today's webinar is going to answer a few questions for you about audiobook production. So Ian, I'll hand over to you to let, to let everybody know what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, thank you. So we put the webinar together because I guess we usually we get asked the same questions from people who want to produce an audiobook but don't really know where to start. Um, one of the biggest concerns, well, understandably is about money um you know is it going to be a really costly thing to produce and might they end up losing money uh, you know how, are, are they going to break even will this audiobook even sell if they put it out there so these are the kind of things people are worried about some people are generally worried about you know um it being an unachievable thing a bit like getting your audio drama on radio 4 or your tv production on netflix or something like that and uh, um hopefully we can debunk some of those concerns uh the the other thing that stops people is just not really understanding the process feeling like it's not it's not really what they signed up to do as a writer and it feels something that's quite a long way from from what they do so hopefully with this as well we'll give you some better understanding of how audiobooks are made and then uh the other thing is the marketplace where, where do you sell them how does that work how do you get on audible um you know do i do i need olivia coleman to narrate it um uh is, isn't that going to be really expensive uh is the book my genre is in a bit of a niche genre will that really sell as an audiobook all of these questions we hope to answer for you today um so the to begin with, we thought one of the best ways to answer that would be to speak to a couple of um, authors who've been through this process, uh, both self-published authors, um, and uh, and have had some success in producing an audiobook and working with us. So we did a couple of interviews with those people. And to begin with, we're going to show that now because we thought better to hear from them who've been through it rather than us telling you how it's going to be. So to begin with, you'll see an interview between me and Nathan Dylan Goodwin, who will tell you a bit about his work and his experience of audiobooks. Right, so I'm here with Nathan Dillon Goodwin, who is an author of a series of genealogical mysteries books, as well as some other books. Uh, Nathan, do you want to just tell us a little bit to begin with about the books that you write? Um, it's quite an unusual category of books. Um, so tell us a little bit about you and, and how you've ended up writing in that way. Okay, yeah, so um, yeah, my books, they are quite, uh, they're quite niche, I suppose. They're, the the broad term is genealogical crime mystery. Um, so basically I've got a main character uh, set in the modern day who has to solve a crime in the past using genealogy and genealogical records and DNA and um, that, that's kind of his, his focus and so in each book uh, he's the main character but the past aspect changes. So the set of in the Second World War, there's one in the First World War, one in the 1800s. So there's a basically a new case um, in each book, and he has to solve the crime using using genealogy. So it's kind of a spin on the detective, uh, the detective kind of uh, style of writing, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's niche, but it's a, it's a it's a growing niche. There's quite a few of us authors out there now, and um, got a growing market. So it's great. And um, so, do you have because? obviously i've narrated your books so i've read them um <laughs> and they the the interesting thing is that there's is a huge amount of knowledge and research in your books about the process of genealogy as well as a you know a well-written detective process as well um so do you have experience of that world outside of the kind of literature world Yes, yeah. So I started doing my family tree when I was about twelve years old, right. um, and have continued it as, as as I'm not a professional, but I've do it, done it as a hobby since then. Right. Um, and particularly with DNA records and uh, the process of uh, using DNA in genealogy, I've really tried to keep on top of that. And it's so fast changing um, world 
in genealogy and so I've kept on top of that um, and I do all the research that the character in the book does I do it first so if he goes to a record office or an archive or a library or a churchyard I do all that first to make sure that the process and the records are completely correct and accurate because my biggest readership they are genealogists and I know that <laughs> I would be hung out to dry if I get anything wrong, you know, so I make sure, yeah, that that, that process is right. But um, yeah, so that kind of came first, actually, the, the genealogy. Um, and then I did a master's degree in creative writing, and that was where I kind of brought the two worlds together. In, and I wrote the first, um, what, what would become the first book, Hide in the Past. I wrote it on that, on that course, because I thought it'd be quite an interesting, yeah, like a spin on the detective uh, genre so that's where it all started and uh, it's going very well that's quite and i guess that you hear about that and in terms of tips for authors and things like that where to start to start with what you know um i guess yeah a totally really useful place to start and that's what you're yeah. advocating there um Absolutely. okay so uh this is about audio books and you've got is it like about seven or eight books in your series yes. it's quite a few yeah. isn't it um nine now nine now so you're slowly yeah. turning all of those into audiobooks um yeah. what for people that are, are have got books out there and are thinking about doing that going through that same process um why did you choose to to begin to launch audiobooks as well as the physical and ebooks and what's been the benefit for you i suppose yeah so it took it took a while actually because i was i was kind of a bit reluctant having had no experience of uh that area at all in, in audiobooks how you go about it um and i i personally have always read paperbacks I, i've never been an audiobook listener either so i've never had i just didn't have an experience in, in either side of the, in the process um and just basically just people along the way kept saying when they're coming out in audiobook that's how that's how i listen or you know that's how i engage with with books audiobooks so i'm not basically you know i'm not gonna be buying your books because I, I I listen to audiobooks and they're not there um and so I thought okay let's let's give it a go and just you know start with one and try it and see how that goes and um yeah that was very well received and and in terms of finances it certainly made its money back um fairly quickly and enabling me then to think okay then let's now work through the whole series I think I was on maybe book five or six by the time I took that decision. So it was quite a, um, a slow catch up process to get through the series. And so now I'm kind of on top of things uh, that when a new book comes out, that then goes straight into, into audio production. Um, so yeah, so the whole series is now available apart from the, the, the very, the very recent one, but yeah. So, and it's, I think the, uh, the listener, um, the listeners have gone up quite dramatically as well. I think audiobook is this very big rising market, particularly in the last maybe three years. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't know the exact figures, but I would say it's at least 10% of my earnings come now from, from audiobooks. Um, yeah, there's definitely, it's definitely a great market uh, of, of people out there that want audiobooks and won't engage in any other way. So basically, if you want that extra, extra those extra people engaging with your work and you kind of have to have the paperbacks the kindle and the audiobooks and i guess um for people you know so it's great to hear that financially that's been useful and you've made your money back which i think is the baseline for most people they don't want to lose money yes. obviously um yeah. and but that also something about how your um your you th those those listeners those people that are absolutely ardent I only listen to audiobooks. I don't pick up ebooks. I mm -hmm. don't do those things. They are then consuming your content. And I guess they will still say to other people, oh, I'm, I'm reading. They use people actually who listen to audiobooks still say, I'm reading. I'm reading this um, yes. <laughs> uh, particular book at the moment. And they'll mention it to other people who might be readers, who might pick up an ebook. Mm -hmm. So it's still Absolutely. widening your yeah. marketing, I think, to a certain degree. Yeah. Talking of marketing, yeah, totally, um, totally. did this all happen by magic? Did people just immediately start um, picking up and buying your audiobooks, or did you have to put any work into that? Yeah, so uh, yes, it, it has taken t 
taken a lot, a lot of work actually in the background, you know. Um, so I basically I contact lots of genealogical um, societies around the world and I send off free copies of my books is one way I do the marketing. Um, another way is through Facebook advert advertising, through Amazon advertising, and that promotes the series um, across, all, across all three platforms. But also Audible, um, once a production is up and running, it's, a, it's available out there, they give me, I think, it's 25 um, promotional codes for America and 25 promotional codes for the UK to basically give it away for free. So that's really good for competitions and things. So I can say, you know, this book is uh, it's just come out and, uh, you know, you can win a free audiobook code basically to be able to listen to it for free. So, yeah, the, the marketing is is quite um it's quite rigorous, really, and I have a newsletter with about twenty-five thousand people in it now, and so that goes out regularly with various updates on what I'm up to in my writing life. But I will always include in there um, a special. I'll send a special um, shout out to say that the book is available now in audiobook. So suddenly, I've got you know twenty-five thousand people there that are aware that that's uh, available. So yeah, it's quite. It's quite a a lot of work on me whereas if obviously if you go down traditional publishing um i believe all that's kind of um carried on uh in in house you know so you wouldn't be needing to be doing quite as much background work but it definitely is worth the the investment of of time definitely yeah so you're very much talking from a self-publisher's perspective and the work that you've yes. put in there okay thank you and i guess sort of just to finish off um because that's just been really useful insight what what would your tips be i guess to anybody that was just thinking about doing that just getting out there um at this stage uh and and beginning to produce some of their books sounds like you know maybe have more than one book on the go already sounds like an important part of that from what your experience was starting from you know once you had three books out beginning to think okay let's try these audio books um, yeah, I, de I definitely think, yeah, well, if, once you've got a few out, then you can kind of look at which, if it's a series, obviously, you would want to start at, at book one. Um, and I would just say, just just start to explore the process, because actually, it's a it's a bit like with the independent, independent publishing world, that people think you can't publish a book unless you have this huge outlay of money to start with. And actually, you know, you don't need a huge outlay of money. Um to get the ball rolling so you can start the process and start to put your work out there and um obviously one of the great things about doing it independently is you get to choose your narrator so put your work out there and start to listen you don't you don't actually have to commit to anything at that stage you can just see is there somebody i think can read this how i how i'm imagining it and how i think it would you know would work as, a, as an audiobook and then start to go through that process and I think yeah, explore it. Choose who you think would be a, a good style of uh, narrator for you, and then yeah, it, it, go for it. Basically, go for it in um, with one book, and then see how that goes. And then if it's successful, which I can't imagine it wouldn't be, then um, yeah, continue going through your through your body of work. Great. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, I think um, I mean certainly the first book I did for you was a novella, wasn't it? And I think so. If you have yes. if you happen to have done a a little a short piece or something like that then actually you're not your outlay yeah, is exactly. quite low yeah. just to get a kind of initial sense of yeah. how's that going to work for a two-hour book you know exactly yeah it isn't going to break the bank to just you know to just go for it and just see if there's a market out there and you might but i think most people will be surprised that you know there's there's a lot of people that just don't want to pick up a book or a kindle and they want to just be listening to something on their commute or you know when they're working around the house or whatever and that's the way they want to read a, a book engage with it indeed some people do you know i think people are sort of in businesses maybe cleaning or dog walking and all those kind of businesses where yeah. actually it's a really nice thing just to be plugged in and listen to something while you're absolutely doing yeah yeah okay that's great thanks very much nathan So that was really interesting to hear his experience in that and his he sort of identified 
the audience for audiobooks and became aware, despite the fact that he didn't listen to audiobooks and didn't know them. So it's interesting to hear that perspective and that, that, that he thinks it's a really important thing to do. And also that he got that return on investment, uh, which is interesting, which is something that they need to consider uh, in, terms of, in terms of that. So, and what do you think about that, Ian, in terms of how do, does, is you always gonna get a return on investment? You know, as he was saying, he'd had quite a good experience. Do you think that's always the case? Well, I thought it was really interesting that actually Nathan had kind of guesstimated that 10% of his income was coming from audiobooks now, which correlates, I think, to figures that I've read around audiobooks being 10% of the, for want of a better word, literature, you know, area of business. Um, so, you know, most of it is still ebooks, uh, paperbacks, um, you know, other forms of, of consumption but 10 percent is audio and because he's got twenty five thousand people on his email list i suppose now that's it's it makes sense he's going to find that 10 percent of the people that he's trying to get to or the people that are interested in genealogy and also like listening to audiobooks are going to go okay yeah we'll, we'll have a slice of that so i think if you're doing well with your current work and the current publications that you're creating and you're building a fan base for that, then just use those figures, work it out, you know, um, how many more people do you need to get before you're going to going to sell those books? If it is just about profit, but of course there are other reasons why you might have an audio book as well, um, because it still gets your brand um, into uh, other people's, into other areas. It gets it onto the web, onto the internet in other places. Yeah. So there's benefits for that as well. And we're going to touch on that a little bit later. We're going to touch on things like marketing and platforms and, and uh, sort of what your reason for producing an audio book uh, might be. So we're now going to go into the second interview, which is talks a little bit more about the, the sort of collaboration and creative process between narrator and rights holder. Uh, so this is myself and Paul L. Arvidsson uh, talking about our experiences with his book. Um, and on the subject of because you've got you had uh, your other books done in audio as well. So focusing on that a little bit, what what do you think? Why do you think it's important to have your work in audio? Would, would it would it have been something that you'd have skipped past, or would you always would you always thought, oh no, that there'll definitely be an audio book? No, I think I've always wanted them to be audio books. Um, the the science fiction series, um, the the shtick of the science fiction series is that um, it takes place entirely in the dark. Um, so the entire series is set with no light whatsoever at all. Um, and so all of the characters who aren't quite human either um, uh, have this entire world that they live in um, that you explore as a, as a reader. Um, and in a way, um, it kind of then had to become an audio book um, because the idea of kind of sitting down in the dark with, you, with your cans on, kind of having it all just happen in oh, your head, is, is, you know, it became part of how I imagined what the thing was, you know. And, um, and so those kind of things, I think, were, were really, really important. And I, you know, I, I'm... I mean, if I, if if we're all about confession after a glass of wine, um, then um, then I'm a I'm a you know I'm a theatre lovely um, by mm -hmm. um, by kind of education. Um, so I, I spent three years at Lancaster and came out with a degree in it, <clears throat> and then mm -hmm. went off to become a techie. Um, but all of that kind of aspect of kind of making a show. Um, and having kind of different ways of telling a story in a way are kind of very much what I'm about. I love the idea of that. But, um, you know, I knew from having done theatre, you know, that it's a, it's a ball-breaking process. It's a, you know, putting, turning something that's flat on the page, which is a, 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 of your listeners who are, who are writers as well, you know, it's a, it's a, or have ever thought that they want to write, you know, it's a it's a massive undertaking to have gotten to the you know the end bit of a you know of a book is an amazing thing to have done. But then when you try and lift that up and kind of 
make it alive in another in another medium it's just you know it's a it's a huge undertaking it's a um and i guess in a way um you've got to have the thing that i've learned from the process <clears throat> is that you've got to have somebody who does it for a living to do it um mm -hmm. and we talked about this when we first started that kind of weird um weird kind of writer voice dating thing where you kind of work out who you're going to like and who you're going to get on with and and whether you're going to work creatively together i think having someone who just knows what the process entails and somebody mm -hmm. who understands the drama of stuff and somebody who also you did a whole load of stuff uh, um because the when you when you take a book and turn it into an audio um it becomes a different thing whether you want it to or not um and there's a lot that you did on the fly um that you asked me about afterwards in the edit things about like taking out speech tags and stuff like that mm. um actually when you write something it makes it very simple you know to have he said she said um um you know you, you get taught in author school that you know that was a that was a a, a, a fad at the time that all the all the speech tags have got to be he's and she's and that's it um but actually that makes a really really boring audiobook um you know and it and it becomes irritating yeah. and you know you took all that stuff out um so all of those things there was a lot of stuff that you do just because of the fact that you're sat behind the mic and you're a performer behind the mic that you automatically think about and it's you know it was just really really it was a lovely process to have all of that stuff um not taken off me but kind of have another creative input i guess in that process and i think that yeah because i think it, it can be difficult uh, i think for writers because depending on how they write it, it might be that they've got a very specific voice of <laughs> the characters or a very specific voice of the narrator and i've known authors who've spent so long trying to find someone with that exact voice and no one's going to have that exact voice that's in their yeah. head yeah. so in a way i think as a writer if you can somehow if you don't have it or if you can somehow let go of it a little bit and as you say trust trust the person choose somebody who does it for a living uh yeah. and uh then then you'll get you'll get a really good experience but i think yeah, it can be hard with, with authors where that they're like, oh, no, oh, this, I want this to sound exactly like this, or I want this to, and then the whole process is, is going to be tough. Um, but yeah, it was it was nice to have have that kind of free reign a little bit, really, where I'd said, mm, should we do this, like this, and can, and can, can we do that, which was nice. I don't know, I've, I've always been a collaborator in those kind of things. I, I'm yeah. very much a fan of kind of, you know, you, you make the most of that kind of dating part of the process and make sure that you get on with the person that you, that you're going to work with and then you can do that then you can kind of throw to throw the ball to each other and you know either catch it or have a laugh if you drop it you know and so it's kind of it's, it's I think, and i think part of that's the, the theatrical background isn't it because if you've ever been in a show that has been a real collaborative process um and i've been in a few that have been wonderful like that where everyone is kind of part of the creation of the show then the thing that you get at the end is is amazing because yeah. it's yeah. been built together in this sort of synergy whereas if yeah. it's been you know you you must move here on this line and do this and la 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 then it, it's not quite so enjoyable and uh, and i think yeah exactly the same for for audio books um, yeah I and, and i've been i've always been i have said this before on the on the lives i'm a bit of a weirdo you know i don't really listen to music i always listen to audio books and i always have so um for me, you know, I am epically passionate about them because, uh, mm. you know, I just think it's brilliant. I love them. So, I, what got, what, well, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so the flip side of that is that do you um, do you ever get kind of um, where well, you've got to read a manuscript and you, you kind of look through it and go, oh, God, look at this one. Um, no, you know, that never terms, happens. No, that's never of, happened ever. In terms of, I, I guess more, I think in terms of kind of difficulty, because you get ones that are kind of, you know, it's entirely head cannon or it's one or two characters. Whereas I kind of threw you a bit of a curve. I, I felt 
um, because there's there's like umpteen characters and you were talking about the idea of kind of inhabiting a voice well bloody hell I, I, I laid it out there for you because there's lots of characters and the thing about it is that I wanted it to be filmic in the way it works in the book but then I thought oh god I've inflicted this on somebody you know and they've got like a million characters and there's kind of scenes that kind of shoot past where there's like to, six to seven honest, characters and you get one line it's so much more fun having having that and actually if you do anything if you narrate um like fantasy it's normally bonkers because there's like 12 dwarves and 14 you know there'll be huge you know 14 elves and all the elves are irish all the dwarves are scottish you, you know it, it, and but they've all got different names and they're all in the same meeting uh which is always fun So a little bit more there from us about the uh, how how the collaborative process works um, from me and Paul. It was nice to listen to your because um, that was all about your relationship, really, as a, a narrator working with an author. Um, and you obviously um, fostered a very good relationship together. And he you know, gave you a lot of artistic license, really, to do what you wanted to do with the book. So I guess the question which I think people might be wondering about is, you know, uh, uh, at what point do you need, uh, what does a narrator, do a production team, need the author to kind of take their hands off and, and, and step away from what's probably been their baby for quite some time? Yeah, so it, this is really important um, because I've seen it with narrators and rights holders from sort of different points of views. But all of that stuff that we talked about with Paul um, was all stuff that we did essentially in advance of starting the recording. So there's an industry standard uh, which is the first 15 which is where you send off the first 15 minutes of the book and the author rights holder approves that first 15. What's important about that is that as a from a writer writer's perspective that in that first 15 are all of the things that you want to know about. So if the first 15 minutes of your book is just one character and you've got a load of other characters in the rest of the book, then you need to have a conversation with your narrator about what to include. So it might be that the first 15 is actually some other snippets of different parts of the book so that you've approved the bits that you really care about. Um, but but also, I would say there is an element of kind of having to having to let go a little bit and giving the narrator a little bit of artist free license. But all of that collaborative process needs to happen in the beginning, in the first couple of, of, of calls and within that first 15 because after that the narrator goes away and has what I call artist free license and they then produce the rest of the book without and this is how it works from a home studio point of view without your input and then send you the, the finished article and if at that point you then come back and say well actually can you change the voice for this character the answer is going to be no because it is far too difficult to try and chop in and change the voice of one character. Um, there's a process at the end where you might come back and, and notice something that's been maybe said wrong, that the proofer hasn't been picked up, something that's totally fine. But you, you can't, after that process, come in with any kind of directorial input. That's what the first 15 is for. So make sure that you've nailed anything that you want in those things before the full recording starts. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So. Um... Sarah's so just beginning to mention there some of the aspects of the technical side of this, which is the recording and, and how all of that works. And so um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more now just to give you more information about really, um, and I've narrowed this down to the sort of two main options are the traditional avenues that people might think about in terms of getting an audio book created. And the most traditional avenue and still used a lot in the UK is the commercial studio. So this would be uh, a, a studio that's set up entirely for audio production. That, that it might be a, a actually set up for recording music, um, but it's latterly been used for recording audio books, audio dramas, podcasts, things like that. And um, in that model, what would happen is that you would, your a publisher would probably go to that studio and say, I want this book produced as an audio book. Um, and then they would um, hire actors, bring those actors into the studio. They would use engineers, um, you know, people that um, are skilled in the editing and processing of um, and recording of audio, particularly spoken word audio. Um, and the recording process would start to happen. And then the studio would clean up all of that um, might be a director there as well so that would all happen 
in the house in this commercial studio and finally they they would spit out a finished audio book at the other end back to the publishers who would then go on to promote it so that's the sort of commercial end of that um and then there's the home studio end which is i guess although it's been around for quite a long time now um it's still something that's gaining traction particularly in the uk in the us it's it's almost you know People use home studios all the time in the US. Um, it's still slightly less in the UK, but it is um, developing. And so really, um, this is a model where a narrator has their own studio at home, probably, um, like I have here. And they have all the equipment that they need, but they also have some technical skills. So they're able to um, record themselves. They don't need a secondary person, an engineer to do the recording for them. And they do that in home studio, which, of course, immediately reduces the costs because this is not a building they're having to pay extra rent on. Um, it's not somewhere where they're having to you know, pay council tax fees or any of those things. They're not employing staff to be there. So it reduces the costs immediately because of that. Um, so what's the pros and cons of both of those options um so the commercial studio um you're going to get a brilliant building that's been purpose-built to record things in not hopefully not a single bit of exterior sound will enter that building um, whilst you're recording so there should be no interruptions by neighbors hoovering or you know people, somebody doing the roadworks outside or um, as american colleagues often talk about leaf blowers I don't hear them so much in the uk more more strimmers and chainsaws and things like that but those kind of things might interrupt that won't happen in a commercial studio because it's been made out of loads and loads of concrete and layers and layers of insulation so hopefully no sound will get through you're also going to get great quality um, audio equipment um, you're you're going to have good quality staff that know what they're doing and how to use that equipment um, and you may even have a director or something like that working on it so that's brilliant all of those things are great and going to help that audio book sound amazing but of course the the cons are they have um, cost implications um you're going to have to pay for all of those people you're going to have to pay for that building that was built and created and cost quite a lot of money to make um and you to a certain degree another con is that you you have less flexibility so if you think for a moment um you know if the, they've hired they've got the studio ready everybody's there the actor that's going to read the audiobook has a cold um and then suddenly they can't read the audiobook because they've got a snotty nose and it wouldn't sound very nice Suddenly, that might be, unless you've got good uh, dynamic production where you can drop something else in, that might be a waste of time. Suddenly, that studio is left empty and it's not making any money. Or you've had to pay if you're hiring it already for that studio. But now it's not being you. you know, you're not actually getting any benefit from having it. So there's less flexibility. Um, and it's less dynamic in terms of the way that it can operate than a home studio. So let's think about home studios. Um, so the the the... The pros of home studios are kind of exactly what I was just laying out there, that I can come in here whenever I want. Nobody stops me. I don't need to book it from anybody else. It's mine. I can use it as much as I want to or as little as I want to. Um, if I want to record your book at two o'clock in the morning, I can do that. If I want to do it in the afternoon, I can do that. Um, if I get a cold, I'm not losing any money. It's fine. Nobody, I, You don't have to pay for it. If I'm not working on your book, if I'm not producing your book, nothing needs to be paid for. Um, in fact, you would pay me for the finished book anyway. You wouldn't pay me for the the, the hours that I work. Um, that's all wound up in, in the finished product. Um, also, uh, actually, sound quality, there really is very uh, next to no difference. I mean, it does depend on the home studio. Mine is very well insulated against sound. Occasionally, some sound can creep in if it's particularly loud. Um, but because I'm in here and I'm listening, I just stop recording. Um, that's fine you know uh, and then I can just wait for it to go and then I carry on again so that's my problem I just deal with that it's only a time issue in terms of the acoustic properties the space sounds amazing it's lovely hopefully you can hear now that it's it's a nice even via YouTube um, you get a sense that there's a nice um, sound to my voice in this space um, there's no echo um, it's a very good microphone it's a large diaphragm condenser microphone and it picks up anything so it's a very, very sensitive microphone. So I can use this microphone because I have a space like this that has no additional sounds in it. But if I was in at home and there was like a, a coffee machine whirring in the background, it would pick that up as well. It would pick absolutely everything else up. It just it just hoovers up sound. Um, so I can use that. So they're kind of the advantages. Disadvantages um, are that I'm having to multitask sometimes. So not only am I 
performing and doing the book i'm also um recording myself so i'm pressing keys on my keyboard every now and again um to go back if i made a mistake and go back over what i just recorded so i'm kind of operating the computer at this at the not at the exact same time but i'm swapping between tasks as i'm performing stopping changing something performing so arguably you could say that might interrupt the flow of the performer um and i don't have you know an engineer doing that all for me that would be lovely to sit here and just do the performance and let somebody else do all of the other stuff but it's a, it's a balance i actually think yes there's an impact but it's not big enough to make a huge difference um if the book is particularly complicated then sometimes i use a live proofer i can have somebody connect to me remotely in the booth and they can just listen into what i'm doing and say mm, ian that's not quite making sense and get a bit of direction anyway so for for when it's required you can still have a director um you can even still have an engineer because it's possible to connect um over the internet and record me directly um with no loss in quality so um, all of those things are possible. Um, the only real downside is potentially that uh, uh, lack of flow. And there's a risk, um, I think, really, to you trying to find somebody um, that's got a good oh, uh, studio. You're going to say I was about to like say, that. yeah. So yeah. I think I think one of the things to take into consideration when you're talking about dealing with a narrator with a home studio, which is a great option, and there are now lots of narrators um, with really good home studios. However, because of the way uh, various platforms work, it's difficult as an author or somebody who doesn't necessarily know anything about home studios or audio recording to identify whether somebody has a quality home studio. So when you're when you're talking to narrators, when you're having those conversations or when you're putting auditions out, um, then have a listen to their samples. Make sure that those samples were samples that were recorded in their home studio, not samples they had professionally recorded elsewhere. Um, and and ask them a few simple questions about their process and what they're using. You might not necessarily even understand the answers. It doesn't matter. But if they can answer the questions, then at least you are aware that you're working with somebody and look at how much other work they've produced and who they've worked with. Um, quite a lot of narrators will have you know referrals and things that they can they can send to you. But yeah, do check out the quality of the home studio in whatever way you can. We work with narrators and, you know, as an organization, we, we don't use a, a, a large studio. We use people with their own studios. Um, and what we do is we, we work with people that have a proven track record of producing professional quality audio. Um, but also before we use them, I always ask them for a sample of raw audio from their studio. So I don't, so there's no, they add no effects to it, no background sound. They're not allowed to take anything out or edit it. I could tell if they have. Um, and I just want to hear what the sound is in that space with nothing else done to it so we start from that level and then if that sounds good i know that any editing or mastering yeah. afterwards is going to sound clean and, and good as well so yeah that's it's, kind it's, of where we start it's probably a good point actually to bring that to bring that in now as, as we're talking about it is because uh listening shelf audio we're talking about audiobooks and how they're produced and what what we do as a company and obviously ian and i are are, are on here but it's not just about us narrating so we have uh, other narrators that we uh know and deal with so we can take that process a little bit away from you so you don't have to worry about whether the narrator has a proper home studio or how to work out what the audio quality is because we're going to do that for you that's kind of part of our process if you're working with us absolutely yeah. um the other thing and something that we've been doing more of recently is um so we've been talking about finding a narrator but you might be thinking well i don't need a narrator i'm gonna do it um and you know that's that's fair enough because in some circumstances maybe you are the right person to narrate your book um it, generally i find that people that are the right people to narrate their books it's generally people that have created uh, uh non-fiction work and often there'll be people that it, it's a sort of business book of some sort or something that book in some way uh is promoting what they do for their everyday kind of living um so an example would be um uh, i did a book recently for uh, a woman who she she is a, a a millennial she describes herself as a millennial um with kind of expertise in financial stuff and she does um she's often on the on the on the radio doing financial programs talking about investment and things like that but her, she's her brand she's very much her brand her voice is her brand as well because she's on the radio so she wanted to do it herself uh, it was actually during lockdown 
So what we did is we sent her all the equipment that she required um, to her house in Scotland. I'm here in Derbyshire. Um, that included a kind of pop-up booth. Um, so this works if you've got a house that's on a relatively quiet street, say. Um, it won't work if you are um, living in a flat um, in a high-rise building in a big city and upstairs you've got a family of seven with loads of kids and downstairs you've got a woman that's keeping dogs and cats and all sorts of stuff. So if it's a really noisy place, it's probably not going to work. You're going to need to get a studio somewhere else. But for a, for a reasonably quiet residential house, um, it worked perfectly well. We sent the equipment, um, including a microphone and uh, audio interface and a micro computer. She can plug that into the internet. And I, in my studio right here, can hear her in perfect crystal quality and record her as she narrates her book. So we did that um, and it was a really good experience for her and for me and she was able to sit in the comfort of her own home and do that. So we have that option for people that do want to narrate their own book, but have a think about, you know, are you the right person to do it? You know, sometimes some fiction books do require quite a lot of acting and performance elements to them and maybe that's something that you're not confident with and that's fine. Yeah, and, and, and on that subject, actually, that leads us very nicely into kind of casting your audiobook. And I think it's some, some really simple things about that, really, is have a think about the narrative voice in your book, very simply. You might have, depending on how you write, you might have very specific, you might have cast your book when you were writing it and have very specific famous people's voices in your head. Um, you, you might need to let go of that a little bit. But it's really important for you to identify uh, the characters and the accents in the book. And when you put out an audition, however you're going to do that, and we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about platforms and things later, um, you need to be quite specific because there are a lot of narrators out there. And you might think, or I've, I've certainly had the comments before, with like, well, I thought all narrators could just do every accent in the world. And they can't. And I can't. I'd, I'd love to be able to do every accent in the world, but I can't. Um, so do identify the different accents that you might need in your book um, because it's really important to, for you then to get the right auditions in. Otherwise, you might get a huge amount of auditions and, and half of them won't be relevant to what you need. So be very specific on your audition about the accents in the book, the characters in the book, the point of view um, and, and the narrative voice. And also have a think about during that process. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this in potentially a, an entirely separate video, but we, there are di different versions. So the majority of audiobooks still are single narration. So the narrator will narrate all of it and all of the characters. So you need to make sure you've got a narrator that can cover all of the characters in your book. However, there are dual du duet and multicast options where for example Ian and I have done a few where he's done the male parts and I've done the female parts or you get bits where they do the different point of views which is quite popular in romance so research that a little bit and uh, and have a think about how that relates to your book so that you've made those decisions before you start sending out your auditions um, but yeah, be, be as specific as you can, I think, on, on those audition process. And don't put things, and there's something that I know um, Ian thinks, is don't put things that are less specific, like, oh, a slight Glaswegian accent or something, because that's, that doesn't really help. That's not really possible. And it's more about the characters anyway, isn't it, Ian? So Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think that kind of, sometimes if you're so if I was Glaswegian, to come up with a, a slight Glaswegian accent, I suppose in terms of to soften my own accent would probably be easier, if I, particularly if I'm an actor. But if I'm not from that part of the world and I'm having to create an accent, um, you know, and amongst lots of other accents, don't don't get hung up too much on the accent, I think is basically what I'm saying. And if it's going to be slight Glaswegian, it's like, it sounds to me like you're too hung up on this. Whereas actually, describe to me the character. What is what is he or she like? What What's their kind of, what are the stuff they fear? What are their hopes? What are their anxieties? How anxious are they on the spectrum of one to 10? You know, are they, how confident are they? Then I, I can adjust my body, my physicality and my psychology. And then that character is going to sound more real anyway, whether it's a slight Glaswegian accent or no Scottish accent whatsoever. So, you know, that's that's kind of the thing to think about. And, and, it, and, it, and, it can, and for, the, for the narrator, it makes it much easier because if those characters are, um, sort of well-defined and you've discussed that as I say in this stage at the beginning that we talked about then even if you've got six characters all from the same place all with the same accent if they have very different characteristics it's really easy to create as you say a different physicality a different thing which comes through in the voice so yeah but the seven dwarves are quite easy to do the seven dwarves because yeah. they've all been given right quite clear characteristics haven't they um 
Okay, so um, and the other thing I was going to say on just on that casting thing, um, if you are doing this, and again, at Listening Shelf, this is something we would want to take off your hands. Of course, we'd give you a, a say in the process, but um, so you didn't have to go through tons and tons and tons of auditions. Um, but when you are listening to an audition, and particularly if you're not working with someone like us who's kind of pre-vetted the audio quality, um, don't listen to the auditions on your iPhone whilst sitting on a bus. You need to be in a quiet place and ideally with over the ear headphones so you can hear all the nuances of what's been recorded because if you think about it if the space in which they were recording is a bit noisy you're not going to notice that if you're in a noisy place you know even if you're at home and actually you've got the whir i was trying to do it the other day i was recording something in my office which is next door to here using a dynamic microphone and i wanted to know i wonder if that's picking up can I use that in places where there's a, a background whir from a computer? Is it picking up? So I recorded myself and then listened back and thought, well, of course I can't hear it because I'm sitting next to the computer that's whirring. So there's a, the whirs there anyway. I need to take this audio into a quieter space to assess whether there's any noise on it. And that's what, you know. And actually, um, Ian, why, why is that so important? Just thinking about that, because you you might hear... Um, something and you think well it's only a very slight you know I can only barely hear it so, so surely mm. it doesn't matter but it but it does matter it does matter because there is a limit to the the, the noise floor what's described as a noise floor that's acceptable from people like audible so and I think it's something like uh, minus 60 db um, so that's quite quiet actually um, so anything that's noisier than that and seems to be there constantly means that your audio wouldn't pass those things now there are there's tricks that you can do there's special programs that you can use that are really quite clever at taking away audio but no program can take away uh, a sound it you know a pro that these are logical things computers so it's taking away a sound frequency a part of a frequency so when it takes away that computer word for example it's also taking part of that frequency away from everything else so it will reduce the roundness, the richness of the vocal recording, um, as well as the, the rest of the audio that's going on. So sometimes you do that and it's, it's, not the big, it's not the biggest problem in the world, but it just means that you're just starting to reduce the quality. And you don't you know if it's not there, you don't need to reduce the quality. So but the best engineers and people that record audio, record music, you know, they, they all want to get the recording right. If they get the recording right, they have to do very little post-production. If you're having to fix lots of things post-production, you're not going to get the quality of recording that you want. So that's why. Yeah. Um, okay, so a little bit now on uh, distribution. So the once you've made your audiobook, hopefully, and you're pleased with it and everything's gone very well, um, you'll need to sell it somewhere, really. Um, now, the place that everybody knows about is Audible. Audible was bought by Amazon, which many people may already know about. Um, and Amazon decided to, as it did kind of, you know, I guess one of the good things you could say about Amazon, but they opened up this market for self-publishing. So authors were then able to sell their eBooks and they really opened this market. And I think they wanted to do the same thing with audio books. Um, so they created this place, ACX, Amazon Creative Exchange, where um, you could put your book on there, find a narrator, get it produced, um, you know, relatively cheaply in home studios and things like that. And it opened this marketplace. And to a certain extent, that has been really successful for people. Um, and it's allowed people, you know, more and more people to get into the audiobook world, which is cool. Um, the downside with ACX is there's no bar for entry. So anybody that's on there as a narrator could just put that, you know, they can just make it up. They can just record something on their phone and put it on there. I'm not saying they'll get work, but it's a lot of people and nobody's really checking the standard of them as narrators. When they finish producing a book, ACX do check the standard of that and it won't get through if it's not good enough but that's a bit late for you if you've already paid for it so you know that, that you don't want it work that to work that way but lots of people still use acx um nathan who was talking earlier um he uses acx and indeed when i was early in my narrating that's where i started and i got one of nathan's books was one of my first books so um it's a great place to get things started i'm not saying it's all bad um, the other main platform, the other sort of competitor with ACX is a find a way books and they have a few different divisions in terms of how they work, but they do have a marketplace, which is similar to ACX. Um, they are now owned by Spotify. 
um, or majority owned by Spotify. So they are going to be even bigger and um, definitely competing with Amazon um, along the way. So the thing with them is I would say that they're perhaps a safer bet in many ways because you're going to get your book onto exactly the same platforms, Audible, um, iTunes, Google Books, all of those places, Spotify. Um, but you are... Uh, you're going to be guaranteed there is a bar to entry so as a narrator you can't get a find away account if you haven't um proved you, that you've got a, a decent enough quality studio and they've assessed the audio that you create so um sarah's put up a few uh sort of platforms there distributors uh so all of these people are now distributing audiobooks in different ways um the great thing about um uh find a way um and acx does also have this option and there is another uh, platform that sometimes people use spoken realms but that's mainly for public domain books so we won't get into that here it's not going to be so useful for you if you're if you're writing your own work um but they they you have the option for um exclusive or wide distribution um which is pretty obvious if you go with exclusive um it's only going to be on for acx that's only going to be on audible itunes and i think possibly not is it google books i'm not sure but definitely on itunes and and um Amazon and Audible. And so if you go for that, they're massive platforms, still a huge majority stakeholders in terms of the audiobook world. Um, and you get a slightly better deal in terms of the revenue you get back for the sale of your book. So, you know, there's an argument that that maybe that's one way to go. Um, the other option is wide distribution where you get slightly less back on the revenue of your books, but it goes to a far wider group of um, suppliers. Um, I think personally, I think if I was doing that, this is the way that I would go now, because I think more and more people are becoming aware of different platforms. They're developing their favorite platforms, so people that they would rather get their audio content from. And as always happens with these massive organizations, um, some people are less than happy with the way that Amazon has conducted itself and might not want to purchase from those platforms. So you access a group of people with different um, requirements, different needs as customers if you go um, with wide distribution. It also um, gives you the opportunity to, to sell the book directly yourself. Um, which you can do. It's not that difficult to create an audiobook file um, and sell that on your website and people can download it directly from you and you can take all of the profits from that sale once you've paid for your um, production of your audiobook. So it's really worth considering, especially if like Nathan, you've got 25,000 people, you've got people visiting your website, you may well sell some of them. And it's and something... You, control, that, you obviously have control over pricing, which is one of the things that you don't have control of uh, with Audible. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. They'll they'll price it for you. And sometimes people think, God, you know, it's way too expensive for, for, for my book. I don't want to sell it at that price. So, yeah, you can take control of that um, by selling it yourself. Um, and then if talking, uh, we're talking earlier about, you know, if you produce something short, maybe you wanted to do a giveaway. Um, just to get people interested in your work. I know people do that with uh, writing. You know, if you're planning on writing a series of seven books, quite often people in the self-publishing world will write the first one and actually just give it away for free or like next to nothing as a Kindle. Um, so they get lots and lots of people. They use that to build up their, their fan base. Then the next one they'll change for, I think it's called the freemium model, isn't it? Um, and you could do something similar with audio by creating your first audio as maybe a podcast so you don't even have to go down the um, audible distribution channel um it well uh, interestingly you'll it will come up on amazon anyway if you start to distribute a podcast yes. um but you can just create a podcast which is maybe your short novella broken down into 10 10 minute episodes um and you've sort of abridged it for that um and that can get people interested and not every single episode you can point them towards the next book which they can pay for somewhere else so yeah. yeah there's options there yeah and on that that kind of again that moves us into just briefly talking about the marketing side of things so there's lots of ways to I think one of the things when you're going into getting audio produced is you need to sort of sit down and decide why you're doing that what what is it for are you doing it because you want uh, as we heard from some of the authors earlier because you want an audio version and you want to engage with audiobook audiences and you already have a following to market that to then then that is potentially you know an unabridged straight audio book version however 
because audio overall is growing, there are lots of other ways to, to look at it as it as part of your overall marketing. So are you producing an audio book because that then gives you it improves your image because you have an audio book, you have uh, a paperback and a hardback and, a, and it completes the profile of, of all of your work. Um, so in terms of that investment, you know, have a look at what, what you're doing it for, why you're producing the audio book and, and exactly what before you go down the process and before you spend the money, what you want out of it um, and how you think you're going to get that money back. And then as Ian was talking about, there's lots of lots of, of fun little ways of playing around with it. And actually, Paul uh, did it with his book where he created a short uh, version, which was the same characters, a little short novella. And he created a, a, an audio version of that, which he gave away to his fan base in order to then gently move them into actually paying for the full audio book. So there's a lot of nice ways of doing that, plus the, the, the sort of serial version of doing podcasts and that kind of thing and engaging with your audiences. But I think the main point is that don't expect to produce an audio book and for it to sell on its own just because you have produced an audio book. Audible don't care about your audio book. They are not going to market it for you. Um, you have to have a reason and or a marketing plan in place great so that brings us to the end um succinctly just under an hour which is great um i hope it's been a, a useful webinar for you and if you're watching this after we did the live version then i hope it's a useful video for you um and really just wanted to say towards the end end of this um, at Listing Shelf, at the moment, we're a production company, so you can come to us um, if you have an audio book or an audio drama or something you want to produce. We can um, do the work to produce that for you and charge you for that process. Um, we're hoping to do more and more um, publication where we can begin to create the work that, we, that we're interested in and put that out into the marketplace ourselves. Um, and one of the things that we're particularly interested in, Sarah already said it, but we, we, we want to shine a light on UK authors and UK narrators. And, um, and we're particularly interested in the world of sort of independent bookshops and publishers, because I know, having spoken to them, that sometimes they're a little wary of audiobook production. Um, it feels to them like um, people click on links and just get taken off to Amazon and they lose them as customers and they, they want people to come into their shops and they feel that audiobooks aren't the kind of thing that bring people into their shops and I can understand that. So we're working on a model where we can take uh, a, a listening shelf, a literal shelf, a bit like a listening post into an independent shop and have three or four titles available on there um, that people can listen to a sample of in the bookshop. And if they want to, they can buy a little card in there, take that home and download the book. And so therefore the transaction actually, actually happens within the independent bookshop. So we're kind of excited about working like that and, and trying to diversify the, 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 the culture of audiobook consumption a little bit. Yeah, and I and I think for us it's uh, about engaging with independent authors, independent publishers, and independent bookshops, and trying to sort of bring that all together. Because as you say, because Audible have dominated the market, they're this big giant. But I feel like it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, so that's our, our dream. Like we're working on that. But in the meantime, yeah. feel free to get in touch and uh, send us any questions you have. You can email us at office at listeningshelf.co.uk and you can also book a consultation so if you are thinking about getting into audio and you're kind of ready to take the next step then feel free to send us an email and either Ian or I will come back to you and we can have a video chat with you absolutely well thanks, thanks very, very much. much have a great day <laughs>